obedient. Um, two days ago, I just I had the flu after Christmas, and then two days ago, I noticed some stiffness in my on my face. I don't normally talk out of the side of my mouth, but two days ago, I had Bell's palsy. Paralyzed. Hopefully, this is temporary. Um, but you can it takes a little effort to talk. This is a spiritual attack, though, and I said I have to I have to speak as long as I still have a voice. I know that God wants me here. Um, God has been too good to us in order for me just to say, you know what? I think I just just postpone. We'll do it another time. Um, so hopefully you can kind of understand me a little bit. It takes a little bit of effort to push my lip. <laughs> I can't even. I, what? <laughs> Seriously? But here I am. So by God's grace, um, I am. I am so nervous. So this is so so out of my element, and I. Just, feel very emotional. This is still very new for us. Um, I still feel very raw. My, my son, a year ago today, was totally healthy. So I'm still kind of going through the season of first. And um, I know I can make you cry. I'm actually, uh, it turns out to be one of my gifts these days. I'm really good at just making people cry. But that's not my intention. My intention is not for you to say, that poor girl, what she had to go through. Because I know that I don't have the coordinate on the market on suffering. I know that all you would have to do is just talk to one of you to know that we've all got stuff going on. Bad stuff is, it's everywhere. And just because we call ourselves Christians doesn't mean that we're exempt. If anything, God says that we are, that's the only thing that we're promised, that we're gonna have hard times. But he told us that we don't have to do it alone. Um, I'm assuming that most of you, if not all of you, are aware of the story. So I'm going to try not to, con to focus as much on the drama, um, because as much as the drama exists, um, it's a place that I visit sometimes, um, but I can't stay there. So we'll visit it for a little bit today, but I thought the more significant part of my story is what happened before, how God has been there for, for 30 years, and how he's faithful to my family. That's what I wanted to start with. Um, as Trish mentioned, I have like the most amazing mom in the world. Um, and she's right here too, to keep me honest. And my, my, my two siblings that are here too can totally attest to that too. Not just a mentor in my mother's a preschoolers group, but a personal mentor all throughout. Um, I won't say that my parents are perfect because no one is perfect, but um, they were pretty close. They, um, my mom was home with us, and my family made sacrifices in order for my mom to be home. My dad owned a business, and my mom was home with four kids. And um, I'd like to say that my parents parented on purpose. Um, they didn't just go through the day and just like just trying to survive or keep their heads above water. I'm sure there were years of that in the beginning, but they parented on purpose. When they did something with us, it was to spend quality time and invest in us. And those of you that have families know, especially if you have more than one, it's, it can be very difficult to feel like you're trying to divide your time. Um, my dad would go to the post office and say, you know, Ellie, do you want to come with me? You know, just post office. It's not like they had stopped and got ice cream. It was just quality time. Dad would go for walks after dinner, say, Marissa, do you want to come for a walk with me? And just that time that we spent, the quality time with my dad, because um, we were home all the time with my mom, was really significant, not just our emotional being, but our, our spiritual beings as well. Um, because my mom was home, it was about time and not about money. Some of my friends had a lot of my friends had a lot more money than we did. But um, when it would come to the weekend or what are we going to do for fun, I'd say, well, your dad offered to take us go-karting. Like, or we'll swim in your pool in your hot tub. We'll go there. And they're like, but your mom said she'd make us chocolate chip pancakes. And we'd do cookies together. And she'd probably let us in her craft room again. And I'm like, seriously? Like, can we go go-karting next weekend? You know? But my mom, even my friends knew too. And then because she was a hairdresser, she was like, honey, your bangs are a little long. You want me to trim them? I'm like, oh my gosh, mom, that's the style. Like, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> Um, but my friends knew, too, that my mom was there, and they wanted to be where she was, too, because just because of who she was. And I don't know if it was which came first, the encourager or the hairdresser, or if the hairdresser comes before the encourager. It's kind of like one and the same with her. But um, the, the time. We would spend, and I also like to do crafts, so we would spend hours into the evening in the basement just talking, you know, um, about everything. This is mostly like in my teen years in high school, and I'd come home a lot in college because I was pretty local. 
um, we talk way into the evening about the Lord, about school, um, and like, do you think I will ever get married? You know, I'd, she'd tell me her story of how she met dad, but it was always an example. God was always there. He was always in our house. It wasn't just, we went to public school. It wasn't just that we went to church on Sunday and that's where we got filled up for the week. Um, my parents made an effort to spend time with us individually and, as, and to do things as a family as well. Um, one of the significant things that my mom did growing up that I try to do as a mom now too is encourage her husband. When she fills up her husband, my dad then had love to flow to us girls. Because with three girls and my brother as the youngest, um, he kind of had to have some strategic retreats about well, at least once a month. So poor guy, at least he had an office to like run to during that time when we were all PMSing at the same time. Um, but she invested in him so that he had enough to invest in us. And um, when I would want to talk, so I'm, I'm, kind, I'm a relatively quiet person. I, I get a lot of um, energy when I'm by myself. Um, it takes a lot of energy for me to be out. Um, but when I would talk, it's really difficult to shut me up. So I would go and talk, and my dad's watching television. And this is the time before DVR. He couldn't just, like, pause it. My dad would, like, he would, you know, see that I'm on a roll, and I, I want his attention, you know. What girl doesn't want the approval of her father? And so I'd sit down, and I'd kind of sit there for a little bit, and then I'd be like, um, can I just tell you something? You know, it's like, I just want to talk. I want to converse with my dad. He would turn off the television. And, like, having a husband now, I know what a big deal that is. Um, that's a really big deal. Um, and it's not like he could just pause it and come back to it. He would physically turn it off and then look and then be conversed with me. And he wasn't like, is she done? We're going on like 20 minutes now, you know. Um, they, they made the effort, and we knew it. Um, when it was our birthday and we were in public school, he would um, write a note for us that he would pick us up from school and take us out to lunch just for an hour and then bring us back. During those birthday lunches, um, he would talk about our goals. What are your goals for this next year? He, we also had a holiday, so he would take us out. So like my sister had a December birthday, so her holiday was July 4th. He would take her out for breakfast. And we all had a holiday that kind of like sort of half our birthday. Um, talk about our goals. What, wh where, where are your goals, and, and what are you thinking for the future? Um, from your dad. I talk with my mom all the time, um, and you kind of just plan on your mom always being there. But this was from my dad. It means something more when it comes from your dad. Um, when we were going to college, my sights were set on a college that was just an hour and a half away. So my dad he drove, he brought, picked up Chinese on the way, picked me up in between classes. We had lunch at the soccer field. But when um, my sister went to college, she was looking at a place in Indiana. And he, she said, well, Dad, what if we go to school, like, far away? Would you still, you know, take us out to lunch? And he's like, well, I guess the flights would get expensive. Seriously? Um, they, they, I, I can't talk about my story of faith without talking about my parents. They made a significant impact. So I was one of those lucky ones who didn't have to suffer through like uh, abusive relationships. I never had to worry that my parents were going to get divorced. I was we were, we were comfortable. I was God has always been good to us. How He brought my parents together. It's I mean in the ge generations I I could the stories I could tell you about God's goodness. But we saw the gospel in our parents. Um, they prayed with us. They prayed for us. And that's something that's really important to me in my own parenting, too. I want to be like that with my kids. Um, I was very young when I realized that even though I was a pretty good kid, um, I needed Jesus. I was, it was probably about five. It was like one of those things in Sunday school where I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go to hell. Please make sure, you know. And then you like say it like 20 more times, you know, through the course of the month just because I don't know if that stuck. But, uh, but I knew I needed God. I knew I needed God because I've had bad thoughts about my sisters and we've had fights and, you know, it's just, my older sister was just stronger than me. You know what I mean? So I try to fight with words and then she would come back with the fists. And I say that as she's, she's in the other room changing my daughter right now. I shouldn't even talk so <laughs> um, but I knew I needed Jesus. I knew I wasn't perfect. Um, but I was a pretty good kid. And I was the kind of kid where, like, my parents wanted to be able to say yes to me. Um, and you kind of think about your relationship with your parents. And I think many of us, when we get to know the Lord, we start with, our, with how we think about our father. When we think about our dad and his presence in our life, that's how we come to think about our Heavenly Father. And if you were one of those people that had a great relationship with, their, with your father, 
I just say, what a blessing it was for us. But those of you that didn't have that, it's not too late for you because you do have a heavenly father who does care for you and wants to listen to you. And he does turn off the television when you come and you want to talk to him. Even with all the millions of people in the world that he, he, can be, he is as big as you can imagine and yet as small as you can imagine too. My life verse from um, very early was Jeremiah 29, 11. God knew the plans that he had for me and it was to give me hope in the future. And I believe that. And even though things didn't always go exactly as I planned, they always turned out better. Um, it's a, I'm, I don't know, I guess you would say determined. Uh, you, you know, teachers always have to put a positive switch on it. Uh, my mom would say I was determined and that, um, you know, confident. Other people might say headstrong, stubborn. You know, I fit into all those categories too. Um, but I knew, I knew where I wanted to go to college. I knew where I wanted to get a job. I knew exactly what I was going to teach and it just had to make sure that the right people hired me because, you know, I want to teach a second grade at Clarence Center Elementary. It doesn't sound like too big of a deal, right? When I was learning to write, I'm like, I have to get this right because I'm going to teach this someday, you know? Headstrong. Um, but God had a plan. So when I would talk with my mom, oh, do you think God has someone for me? I really want a family. And she would tell me about God's goodness with, with my dad. And I'm like, well, it does seem like kind of one in a million. Um, but the God that I know is faithful. And I know that he is good. So when I was interviewing for a job, the only people that would hire me was um, middle school. <laughs> middle school? Sixth grade? Are you kidding me? Like, these kids are crazy. They are so... They, they're hormonal, but don't even know it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I want like the same 20 kids. And like, they love you just because of who you are. And like sixth grade, they're like in and out in 40 minutes. And I'm looking over at Chantal, it was my, my first year. I had my first cousin in my language arts class. And I was like, oh my gosh, I cut my hair really short. She had to practice call, not calling me um, Mindy, calling me Miss Albright, you know. Um, it was like, oh my gosh, so, but I'm, middle, I'm not middle school. I'm not, I, I'm elementary school. But you know what? I loved it. They literally got under my skin in a good way. They really got, I, greatest job in the world. They still, they still get excited about stickers. You know, sixth grade, you put a sticker on, you walk around and like draw a little star on their, on their paper. They're like, oh, I want a star on my paper too. Um, it was amazing. But because I was there, my third year, there was a man who was walking around the halls who had just finished his degree in secondary social studies. So he like should have been in the high school, but he was in the middle school where it's six, seven, and eight. What other building would I have been? Would I have met this Andy Sauer who comes walking through the halls if I hadn't been at that school? So it's like he was from the city. Why is he all the way out in Clarence? Like it just didn't make sense. And then when we start talking, because um, you know he just walks by the room and. He said he was looking for the library. And I'm like, it's right there. <laughs> no. He's like, you would have thought I was a creep if I just said, hey, you know, how's it going? Um, so he asked who the library is. But then after we talk, and I was like, well, he really, I, I, I draw caricatures. I drew all the teachers, and I, I took it. I was like, can I take your picture? Because I draw the pictures of the school, of the teachers in the school. I'll take it home and draw your caricature for your, class, for your classroom. And he was just working as a social studies aide. He was like, oh, sure. So he goes in the doorway. I still have this picture. It's so cute. Um, and, I, and I'm looking at it that night in uh, my third year teaching. You know, everything is home. I have my laptop. And I, brought, I unplugged my laptop, brought it in the kitchen. And I'm like, huh, doesn't he just like, does he have such like an honest face, such kind eyes? And um, I have no idea who this man is, but he's just, he's just really cute, you know? And my mom goes, Mindy, I can picture you with someone like this. I'm like, oh my gosh, mom, you are totally overreacting. I can't even believe you said that. I go back to my room, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's crazy. But I'm kind of like, yeah, well, I mean, he is kind of cute. So um, throughout the next, the course of the next few days and weeks, as we kind of like, I was very good with hall duty during third and fourth period when he'd walk by, I, you know, oh, good morning. You know, I just applied my lipstick and everything. Um, <laughs> But then we find out we have been going to the same church for the past few years, but we had no idea because we had been going to different services. And we find out because of my first cousin, Chantel, who says, Mr. Sauer, so, you know, do you go to church? He's like, yeah, I go to Eastern Hills. Oh, really? So does my cousin. Who's your cousin? Miss Albright. Really? <laughs> so, it was like, I mean, how, how, how could you not acknowledge that God was part of this? It, I don't believe in fate. I don't believe luck. No, it, no, coincidence, it doesn't happen. This was God. 
I'm like, huh, what a man in the middle from the city coming in. So it was, it was beautiful. Um, and here, I always thought I'd like live in the country, you know, have like a very quiet life with a, I really did think I'd have a boring husband because I really don't need a lot of excitement. I don't like to dance. Well, it turns out I marry the coolest guy in the room who loves to dance. And I thought I was doing this guy favors, not liking to dance at weddings. <sighs> I have to go out there just so he doesn't dance with other women. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez. Um, but I knew I, that this was, this was the man that I was married to and he so, he loved the city. So I'm like, okay, well. Um, I'll go to the city. I knew he, I, he had no aspirations to live anywhere else. But do you know that God was faithful? I never, I never begged. I never said, you know, this would, our life would be perfect if we only just lived in the country. You know, I never did. When I first came home from work when we lived in an apartment on Norwalk, I opened my car door and it hit the, do- the house next to me. And I cried. I was, oh my gosh. I, I, my car door just touched the house. And we lived like, it was, it was a culture shock. But, but wouldn't you know, um, God blessed us with kids. We had beautiful um, Jonathan and Benjamin. We call them Jack and Ben. And we lived in the city. It was the most wonderful time. And I, I was like, well, we're, we were living in the city, so I'm just going to invest everything in here. Uh, we went to the zoo. I'd find playdates in the area, and I would drive from, from my house, you know, 40 minutes into the country um, for mops. That was the only outing I did that first year because I couldn't get the whole breastfeeding thing with the twins because they were so different. So I pumped for the first year. Don't ever do that. It was horrible. I never left my house. My mom had to come if I went, ever went anywhere because of course I did it in the car because you've got 30 minutes to and from. But breast milk is the best thing. And then so for the first year. And that's when I blogged because I needed a connection to the outside world. And one of my friends was like, oh my gosh, my friend's having twin and they're twin boys. Uh, what would you suggest? So I'm like, well, if I'm going to write this down for you, I might as well put it up to other, other people. Like well, how many things you need double of, that kind of thing. And it was a wonderful way for me to, you know, and then the, the introduction of Facebook too. Because I'm home, so it was really nice to be able to um, invest in the outside world too. Because in turn, I was blessed. So things always turned out better than I expected. When um, it was about almost three years ago, and my husband was working out in Clarence because even though he's got a secondary education degree, he's a landlord and he loves like buildings, but he was working as a salesman for my dad. He's like one of those, he can do anything. Um, he really is a you know, handy Andy, jack of all trades. He can do everything. Um, so he was driving around on his lunch break and he had told me, you know, if I ever did move out, like, Okay, don't, don't, don't get too excited. But if I ever did move out of the city, I'd want it to be in this area of Clarence Center because it still feels like a community in, in the city. And I'm like, yeah, it really is beautiful. We used to trick or treat there. I really try to stay very low. Okay, I know it's never going to happen. Don't even get my hopes up. He was driving around on his lunch break one day and he was praying, Lord, if this is supposed to be, just, just, just give me a sign. Just give me a sign. And then, I, you know, I, I know she would like this. Well, guess what? He's driving around High Street and there's a realtor putting a sign in the grass. There's your sign. He goes in and he's like, can we make a deal right now? I know my my, my wife would love it. And they're like, no, no. But I mean, it just, and then the details of everything, it was God. There were 11 bids. We weren't even the highest one. It was because we were staying in an apartment that had no lease. We didn't need, it was God. Um, My boys called the backyard a jungle because we had like a little postage, postage stamp yard in the city and then we got outside we had trees it's a 0.86 acres but we have two jungles in our yard we have a little island with like little habitat um and then trees in the back jungles (laughs) and our boys were outside all the time it was really such a blessing megan was just born um so things always turned out better um it was actually this exact day last year january 10th um to said, I'm still in the season of first. This is still a little raw. But January 10th, we learned that we were pregnant um, with Kate. Could things get any better? This was number four. Um, and my husband was so confident in his um, male ability. He said, you want a girl? I'll give you a girl. You got two boys and a girl? I'll give you a girl. Because he has guessed every single one. So he is just that masculine. He knew this was going to be a girl. <laughs> just so you know, I'm like, I have 100%... Um, accuracy rate for guessing the sex of the baby when you're pregnant, I'm 100% wrong. Every single time. Every single time. 
But anyway, he was always right. So he said, you want a girl, I'll give you a girl. I'm like, yeah, sure, it would be nice, two boys, two girls. So um, we went January 10th, and then we're like, okay, let's, it's such a great secret. We're going to try to keep it in as much as we can. You know, Meg and I had to share right away because I was super sick. So I'm like, we'll just try to, you know, this is a really good secret. So it was the best 17 days of our whole married life because at the end of January, um, I got a call from Ben's preschool that he had, he had thrown up and I had to pick him up. Um, and that's odd because Jack always had like more of like a sensitive stomach and Ben was, even though they were always the exact same height and weight, Ben was like a little bit more like not husky, but like solid. Um, Jack was kind of like uncoordinated. Ben was like super physical. So um, I went and picked him up and it seemed odd, but you know, he seemed to get better. And then um, two days later, he had another headache. I had to pick him up and I'm like, maybe this is preschool. You think he's like, is he about, can he like, is there something wrong with the school? He doesn't like going. I mean, I've always been home with them, but like it's just two and a half hours through three days a week. Um, and then he said his headache, his heads were hurt and then it seemed like his stomach and that was making you throw up. So, um, but anyway, as, as things progressed, we went to the ER a few times. Then Andy said, we are not leaving this hospital until we figure out what's, what's wrong. So we go to the ER for a second time and then they do a, a scan and then they said, it's, um, you know, we wouldn't want to alarm you, but it could be a brain tumor. And we're like, okay, well, they're totally healthy. Kids, they came at 38 weeks. Jack was 6'5", Ben was 7'7". Seven, seven. People are like, you're not caring too. I'm like, trust me, there's two and there's a lot of baby in here. Um, there's no explanation. She took us in the other room and uh, it is always scary. You know, your son, it's like one o'clock in the morning and he's all showed up. He had finally fallen asleep at that point and we had just been treating him for constipation and they take me in the other room. The nurse holds Ben and they said, um, it, it's, it's a tumor in his head. Um, my first reaction was shock. You don't really want to hear your husband cry like that. That deep raw cry, it's horrible. It's horrible. I've heard it a few times since then and it's horrible. Um, but after the initial shock, and we cried a little bit and held each other, I told the nurse, um, so we are a family of faith, and God is going to bring us through this. I, was, I, was, I really was very confident. I didn't want to call my mom until the next morning because she'd be up all night. I'm sure she was already throwing up at that point, too, because she, she, she fails for us, too. She prays for my kids just as much as she's ever prayed for us. Um... We started the process when we were in the hospital, and still, the support that came in, the prayers, the, the messages, as we tried to communicate as best we could with um, what was going on with his diagnosis, the support that we received, we could feel, we could feel God just wrapping his arms around us. And I was still, God's going to heal him. God, God would not take my son. God's going to heal him. Um, we take a lot of comfort from, from Jack. You know, his twin, these boys have never been separated. Um, but Jack, he's going to be okay. He's going to be okay, Mom. He's going to, you know, the childlike faith. Before they turned four years old, um, my grandpa, my dad's dad was in hospice at my parents' house. And um, my boys would, was, we've always talked about um, Jesus in heaven, and my boys secured a place in heaven in April of, was it 2013? They knew where they were going, and they knew where Jesus lived, and Jesus has always been with them. So it was, no, it was not unusual for Jack to say, God's with, God's with me, God's with Ben. As we kept going through the process, and we're in the, the hospital, we saw pieces of God wherever we went. There were always fingerprints for him to show. He, was, he went there before us. We were so out of our element. Um, I still hate children's. It's a great facility. H Hospice, Roswell Children's, great facilities. I hate it. I hate it. When Kate was born, she had air in her heart, around her heart. And they said, you know, if she doesn't get better, we're going to take her to children's. And I said, please don't. Please do whatever you can here. Corey Tim Boone had said, there is no deep, no pit too deep that God's love is not deeper still. And we found that to be true. Because 
I know that many of you can attest from all the things that some of the things that you've gone through too, because we we don't have the worst. Um, even in the deepest tip, pit, God is there. And even when you don't feel him, you just have to look up. Because he's been there the whole time. After um, he had surgery, and we just felt so much support from our area churches and some of the people that loved us most, many people I, I, I never, I've never met. So much support in prayers. Um, they had surgery. He had surgery, and then um, they told us Ben's diagnosis when they took it. And so we're like, okay, we can manage this. This is gonna, it's gonna be okay. Kids do, unfortunately, get brain tumors all the time, and they're not always malignant. Um, but when the neurologist, you know, pulls us aside, I just hate that. Gosh, I hate when they pull you aside. They said um, that it's a glioblastoma. It's the worst of the worst treatable. So basically, only he had a 97% chance that this would take his life. So we started changing our prayers. Um, I was so angry. We went home because they told us we were going to go to Roswell and we are going to have an aggressive treatment plan with um, radiation and chemo. And I was so angry. I told my husband, I'm done. I'm done with this God thing. I can't handle it. How can we pray for something that is noble? God, look, you've built an audience. I know you built a platform for us. I know you're going to do good. So why don't you heal him? Can you not hear me? And I remember being a kid, too. My parents didn't want to ever have to say no to me. I was, a, I was, I was a, you know, by the world standards, I was a pretty good kid. I asked to borrow the car because I wanted to get groceries from mom, you know? And I know God kept looking down and said, I'm sorry, but I have a bigger plan. Do you know how hard that is? And as a mom, I know, I, I say things to my son, too, and he's like, but, like, I'm asking for a good thing. And I said, Jack, I know. But mom and dad have a bigger picture. Um, we brought him home. And uh, it was when we found that the, the help at Roswell wasn't, um, wasn't helping at all. His tumor was, um, had tripled in three weeks. And my husband said, Min, we can't do this alone. This is what God, this is all my year, all my, my whole life I've dedicated to the Lord. And this is the thanks I get? And he said, but men, I know we can't, we physically cannot do this without the Lord. So then we I did think, do I love God for who he is or for what he's done? Do I love God just because he's given me all good things? Even if they were different than I initially expected? Or is God enough? And you know, when you think back on the stories of how God has been faithful to me, my family, my parents, their families before, God is enough. And when we dedicated our kids to the Lord, we told him, these are yours, and you can do with them however you'd like. Um, it's a prayer I have to keep, keep, uh, I have to keep saying every day. Because um, as much as I know that they're, they're the Lord's and I leave them at his altar, I keep wanting to pull them back. I just, I just had a baby almost four months ago. How can you not tell me those kids are mine? I sacrificed everything. I quit my job. Those are my kids. The, the havoc that's wreaked on my body, those are my kids. I've got the scars to prove it. But they're his first He is good, and he is faithful. Um, I remember hearing once, a woman is like a tea bag. You only know her strength when you put her in hot water. <laughs> How many know that to be true? People say, Mindy, I wish I could have the strength you have. And I said, it's not me. It's not me. It's only when I empty myself to know I'm just little Mindy. I'm just, I'm just a mom trying to do the best I can with what God gave me. I am not, um, I'm not amazingly strong. I'm really, I'm really not. But, but God's grace is bigger, and he's carried me through. Um, we, we had time to say goodbye to Ben. 
into it for so many moms who have lost kids or even, you know, as adults, where it came as a surprise and they had no warning. I don't even know. I, I don't know. That was, this, it was hard having him at the house, but I'm so grateful. We had time. It, when he was first um, sick, he came home and he was like, my bed, my bed, my blanket. He was just so glad to be home, take a bath with his siblings. And, um, and he would say things like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to go to heaven. And we're, Annie and I look at each other like, we've never talked about, we never said cancer. We never talked about dying. This is just sick. And you know, we, we pray that God would um, give us peace and strength and healing. Um, so he started to talk like this and we're like, oh no, you know, like, what is he thinking? But as time progressed, he would go to bed and of course he's so tired and, and the steroids and everything that's in him trying to keep the, the tumor at bay. And he would say, Jesus is the best. And he said, can you tell me about heaven? With my four-year-old, both of them, we talk about heaven. And he, he, he just say over and over, Jesus is the best. And I can tell you as a mom, I know where my son is and I know who he's with. That hope is what gets me out of bed every day. Because I can tell you there was been days I thought, can I just stay here? I don't want to be a mom today. Can I just be sad? Um, but we have hope. This world's not the end. I'm going to see him again. And who better to take care of him if I can't than God? Like, he's not a bad stand-in, you know? Um, towards the end, we started, we started praying differently. We saw him decline. And we started saying, Lord, give, give us... Oh, Lord, I just forgot what I was thinking. Healing, that was it. Healing or heaven. Because um, it was so difficult. And then when he died, when Ben died, we almost felt a sense of relief. That oh, he's home. He's home. He's with Jesus and he's not in pain. Um, but I can still tell you, I still get, I still, the disconnect between my heart and my head is very, very long sometimes. I'll say, um, I'm so glad he's with Jesus. I'm so glad that he's not in pain, that he's not suffering, that it was a, a relatively short amount of time, three and a half months, even though it felt like three and a half years sometimes. Um, it was so short. Um, I had time to say goodbye, had time to know where he was. But then I say, why do I have to be happy that my son's not in pain anyway? This, this isn't fair. And it's okay to feel angry. Um, it's okay to miss him. Because I do, I miss him a lot. He was my peacemaker. <laughs> And boy, my Jack and Meg, they just don't really get along very well. I miss, I miss Ben. Um, but this isn't the end. We, um, throughout the last few months um, since he died, we've celebrated holidays and anniversaries. And, um, and it's rough. It's really rough. But I can tell you that um, there are some days when I know I need it. And I tell God, I need something. I gotta get through this. I need to know that you're there. I need to know that you're not just this mystical being that's just out there and saying, okay, I'm gonna smite them and I'm gonna allow this to happen to them. I need to know that you're with me and that you care about me because I'm not feeling it right now. Because sometimes that emotion, you get carried away with the emotion. Um, emotions aren't bad. I've got a lot of them. But you can't, you can't live it. You can't allow it to control. Um, We've, we've seen cardinals. We saw so many wildlife. And for us, that was a sign. We see cardinals, it's that's, that's a reminder that God is with us. And the other day, um, I can't remember if it was, it was on a special day, but then was, um, Jack looked outside and we saw a cardinal in the tree closest to our house. And then when I was looking, I said, Andy, in the trees further back, is that a blue jay too? He had both of us, both of them. God has shown us in so many ways that he is with us and he cares. Um, I knew when Christmas was coming up, I was dreading it. I was really trying to distract myself as much as possible. I didn't want to put up a tree. I didn't want to take out all those ornaments of all those homemade years from years gone by. I, I didn't want to do it. But I have other kids. How can I not acknowledge Christmas? Christmas isn't about grief or the death. It is about hope and the birth of our Savior, the whole reason we have behind the faith that we have. I had to celebrate it. So I did it. Um, it was more lip service, but I think that's okay. 
It was our first Christmas. I had the tree up, it looked hideous, but it was out. <laughs> I'm actually going to make new ornaments of Ben, like with his picture, um, every year. I told them, um, these days are gonna be hard, and I'm really gonna need to see you. Um, I need you to show me something, and I'm gonna look for it, and I don't know what I'm looking for yet, but I'm gonna look for it, I'm gonna be aware. Whether it's a bird, or um, a thing of wildlife, or a story, I, I, I need something. Um, Christmas Eve, we were at our mom's celebrating, and um, my Jack and his cousins went outside. There wasn't any snow on the ground, it was all grass. And they said, and Mindy, Jack is in the newspaper. And I'm like, did, did they find one? Like a, like a, um, my mom saved all the, like, the newspapers and stuff like that that had a story about Ben. And I was like, is it Ben? Okay, and um, they bring the paper in. It was a picture from Ben's funeral when Jack was on the video. Um, so it was a picture of Jack up on the screen. Um, I should. I wish I had a picture to show you. the The newspaper did not look like it was being saved. Like the whole article was ripped. It was just of the paper. The ends were ripped. It looked like it had been through like a partial fire. So where did you find this? It was, it was outside in the grass. God was there. And, and I knew that that was what I needed. And um, so I just, even though my mom was like, oh my gosh, that's so horrible when you find this on Christmas. And I'm like, I asked for this. I needed this. Why would a newspaper be in my parents' grass? It would be all... And so even like the next day, my Jack, who's such a thinker, and I was always so surprised that he asked more questions why, why am I not sick? And why did God do this to Ben kind of thing? He's that. And he's so inquisitive, such a thinker, it's really surprised me. But the next day, he's like, so mom, when I was in, you know when I was in the newspaper for Ben's funeral? And I was like, yeah. You know, our, our neck hair is chewed up. We're always like, always on edge. Anything he says, even though it's never anything we think. Um, remember when I was in the newspaper for Ben's funeral? And um, he's like, yeah. He said, so am I like famous? <laughs> I want to say, oh, Jack, you have no idea. <laughs> you literally have no idea. So then he got a magic set for his um, for Christmas, and he's like, "Do you think if I practice my magic tricks, I could get in the newspaper again?" <laughs> Keep trying. I'm sure you can. Um, we have good days where we are. We're we're so blessed by the family that we've been given, and knowing that where Ben is, and just having all the the hope in the world that there's no time in heaven. It's not like Ben's gonna say, "Mom, what took you so long? Where were you? I missed you." He's gonna turn and say, "Oh, there you are." There's no time. It's not that he's been waiting for us. We grieve his loss because it's it's a big loss for us, but it's not for him. Um, the Bible says that Jesus is the first one to wipe away our tears. I'm sure even if Ben felt scared when he first got there, Jesus was the first one that he saw and he wiped away his tears and he said, come on in, you're home. I, um, I still get really scared. Um, when I got the Bell's palsy a few days ago, um, my husband made me go to the doctor yesterday because even though I knew this was Bell's palsy, I knew this was the symptoms to look for. I even had the pain behind my ear. My husband's like, you better go to the doctor. He thought I had a stroke. And like, we always jump to the worst case scenario now. It's just, it's just where we are. Um, I, had, I got the flu right after Christmas. And, you know, I'm the stay-at-home mom. I, I'm kind of used to running the house. And so when mom is down, my husband's like, oh my gosh, Mindy, I don't even realize how much you do. And I'm like, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, but I was sleeping a lot during the day, and then Andy would just bring me, me, bring me the baby to feed her because I, c I couldn't even hold my baby. It was so debilitating. Those of you that had the flu this year, it passed like, oh, my word. Um, and then the headache. The headache was super intense. Um, so I'm up in the middle of the night because I was sleeping a lot during the day, and what does your mind do at night? It just starts, just starts going. And it started going where it shouldn't have gone. And, and as I said before, when I talk about... Um, Ben's story in, in the, the grief that we went through those last few months, it's okay to visit. And we do. I, I, I visit most times with my husband. We go there and we cry about being in Roswell and um, seeing his little body on the couch in the hospital bed. And then when he took his last breath, we still had the kids in the house and we usher them upstairs. We talk about these, we cry, we visit. 
we visit, but we don't stay. We have to, we have to come back home. Um, in the middle of the night, my mind wanders, and I'm thinking about all these negative things, and the tears are flowing, and my head is pounding from the headache, and I just think about what the I had to go through. Um, so I, I, didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I, you can't, I didn't know how to get my mind back from it. It's the middle of the night. Even my daughter is sleeping. And um, so I just, I just kept thinking, any verse I could think of, any praise song, worship song, hymn, um, any, like, just, um, any little phrase I could think of, I just kept saying it. And any time a bad thought was, I just kept, I just kept trying to say all these, all these things um, in order to get my mind off of it because I, I could see myself spiraling down. And um, I, I come, came back to... Um, something in the Bible that I remembered, and I had to look it up a few days later because I couldn't even remember the context. But when Jesus told his disciples, pick up your cross and follow me. And I kept thinking about that at night, like pick up my cross. And in that evening, my thoughts were thinking, we all have a cross. We all have, I had talked about it on the blog one time, we all have invisible wounds, things you can't see. You, I, you can't you can't look at me and even look at my family and see, oh, there's a big gap between a few of those kids. She, maybe she lost one. It doesn't even look like anything is missing. You can't tell. But I choose joy. I choose to, to look for the positives that God has given us because he's still been very good, even if he allowed this to happen for the greater purpose. Um, but I kept thinking, we all have our cross. But then as I looked up, you know, it's the same thing when you're sick. We make the best doctors when we look up on Google to our symptoms. Doctors must really love that. Um, but I look up on Google, and I'm like, so I look up, pick up your cross and follow me. And I realized, like, the intended meaning, especially in the first century, was the worst death that they could put a criminal through was crucifixion, was death on a cross. And so people in the first century knew that when Jesus told them, pick up your cross, you have to deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me. What he was actually saying was they had to physically take their own cross to their own death. You physically have to die to yourself in order for God to fill you. Empty yourself to say, not my will, but yours be done. Because I trust that you are a good shepherd and that you have my best interests in mind, even if it means going through a horrible tragedy, which is, we are just one of many. Because um, unfortunately, this stuff, I mean, you go on Facebook, this stuff happens all the time, just, just breaks my heart. It just seems so young, too. But we serve a good shepherd. And he, he does not look to smite us. But he does say, in order for him to fill us, we need to be empty. We have to physically deny ourselves, take up our cross, in order to die to ourselves and follow him. But he also tells us, take my yoke upon, upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He, he never meant for us to carry the stuff by ourselves. We were not made to. We are not strong enough. We need God. We were created to have the supernatural hole that can only be filled by our creator. Um, and I can tell you that if I didn't know that, um, whether it was because of my parents or because of the many years if I didn't follow, find God on my own, I couldn't have made it. I couldn't have made it. And the only thing that scared me more than my kids losing their brother was if they lost a mom too. I don't want to be that mom. That turns out so bitter. And then the only way that my kids can be close to me is if they talk about how sad they are because their brother died. I don't want that. I don't want to be that. So I choose not to. It's, it's, harder, it's harder than I make a thing, than I say, but it's, it's a daily choice. But I know that I'm not doing it alone, and I'm so grateful that I have a husband that I can talk to and cry with. Um, we're in it together. And um, our sights are forward. He is a good God and he can be trusted. This isn't the end. It's not the end of the story. Um, I have read the end of the story, and God wins. Satan doesn't win. He tried to take me out with this. He's going to have to try harder. <laughs> he could have shut me up, even if I like, kind of mumbled through half of this. Um, we have hope. And when I look back on my life verse, um, Jeremiah 29, 11, 
when I was going through that time and I said, but God, you said you were going to give me a hope in the future. Um, I had a little baby girl and we named her Catherine, which means pure. And her middle name is Hope, pure hope. So I realized God give, did give me hope in the form of my new child. She will know where we place Ben. Um, she'll hear stories of her brother. Um, he's all over our house. I'm not taking down any pictures. Um, but God gave me hope. And he continues to give me hope every day. And I still get scared. The hairs on my neck still stand up when Jack says, oh, I don't feel well, or I have a headache. And my husband and I just, you okay? Yeah, where does it hurt? And we think, oh my gosh. We'll never, we, he had hand, foot, and mouth disease. We thought he had a tumor. We're like, we'll never be able to be normal. But this is where we are. And we can acknowledge it. We just can't live there. God is good. He is bigger than this. He has given us a hope and a future. And I would encourage you, whether you had that kind of dad, to be able to invest in you personally, or if you didn't, we all have the same father. And he was the one who ultimately created us. We had two other partners that had a hand in it. Um, but it was God who created us. Even doctors can't acknowledge that what happens in the womb is, is not science. It's, it's, it's science, but it's, but it's not science. And I could tell you, you can put your hope in the one true thing. You can put it in science. Um, it failed us. You put it in your body. No, it's not going to last. These bodies were just ca temporary capsules. Um, you put in money. I can tell you there isn't any amount of money that we wouldn't have begged, borrowed, or stole in order to have my son's life. Or you can put it in God, which is the only thing that will last. The same God that was there for generations in the past, and the same God that lives in my heart and in my kids' hearts, and the same God that will be there for my children's children. He is always the same. And he's the one who says, as big as he is, he wants to be in each of our lives, to, to empty ourselves, to have full control. And if that's something that sounds scary, you're right, it is. I like being in control. Um, this is not something you can be in control over. But it is very freeing, because I don't have the final say. If it sounds like something that appeals to you, I would encourage you. Speak to one of the, the there are many pastors here, um, women and men, that you can say, how do I get started? You don't have to be as strong as me, because I'm really not, I'm really not. But I can tell you, as weak as I am, I have a God who's been holding me up the whole time, and he promised that he'll never let me go. That is the same God that wants to be in each of our lives and in each of our kids. Can I pray for us? God, I'm so grateful for today. Thank you for allowing me to have a voice. I pray that you would continue to stir our hearts towards you. And I thank you for your faithfulness, how you've never left, let us go. Even in our darkest time, God, you are good and you are faithful. We thank you for today. Let us go in peace in your name. Amen. Thank you.